we still have a lot of doctors who order ECOGs all the time, right? Your, your doctor in, in Huntsville is ordering ECOGs every single day, right? Dr. Dang orders Dang ECOGs all the time. Uh, so they eat, sleep, ECOGs over there. Now, do you do any ABRs? They'll say, oh, very seldom, but ECOGs we do every single day. And luckily, ECOGs are easier to do than they've ever been before with the, with the, uh, with the new equipment. Uh, the trick is to get the, to get the electrode, and now we're not going to use electrodes on the earlobe or on the mastoid. We're going to use an electrode that's actually in the ear canal, and we're going to get that electrode as close as we can to the eardrum because we're trying to pick up a signal that is generated within the cochlea and um, uh, we want to be as close to the source as possible. Right? In fact, that's very important and we try to tell the students who are first time uh, people trying to learn how to do this to be very, very careful to get it as deep an insertion in the canal and use, use the ones that even look like they're like, like they're pediatric even in an adult canal just so you can get it deeper because the deeper you you are able to insert the electrode in the ear canal the higher the amplitude of the response is going to be so if we're using ear canal versus a TM electrode or an electrode on the promontory uh, a needle electrode through the eardrum uh, most people do it ear canal but it's very important that they they're in this range where they're able to really get it very, very deep. It takes a little bit of practice, but you can do it with tip trodes, a little gold electrode like this with special leads, uh, an ear canal electrode. And these are responses on a vivosonic integrity. All right, that's on my left ear. And I, I don't have, uh, I didn't put my audiogram on here, but I, I've got a high frequency hearing loss. Not enough for a hearing aid yet, but uh, <laughs> will be someday. But have you ever seen a better ECOG? Right? Marilyn Gresham walked up to the booth and she goes, boy, that's a good, you know, that's a great ECOG. It's the first thing she said. Um, and um, I mean, this should be in a textbook. But this was very, very easy to do within just a couple of hundred uh, clicks uh, and couldn't miss the summing potential, couldn't miss the action potential and did it twice and very repeatable uh, and very typical. Even on a patient, oh there's, I did put my audiogram, there's my audiogram. So not too bad. So what do we use? We use clicks uh, at a relatively slow rate, something like this, uh, alternating polarity to cancel out the cochlear microphonic so I can actually see a true summing potential not corrupted by a cochlear microphonic. We do it at, you know, as high an intensity possible. I do it at least 95 dB. Uh, of course, it's an insert electrode with an insert transducer and masking isn't necessary. Uh, we have some clinics that are using this. This is a, a little electrode that actually sits on the tympanic membrane but I only have two. I only have two clinics actually doing that. Everybody else is doing it with tip trodes. And it used to be very hard to collect an ECOG with tip trodes, but with the newer equipment, we're not having that much of a problem, except with patients with excessive hearing loss. And of course, what do you get? Well, uh, an action potential and a summing potential. And it's the amplitude difference between the amplitude of the summing potential, this amplitude here, from baseline to the peak, versus the amplitude of the action potential. This is the eighth nerve action potential from the baseline to the peak. Uh, and in normal patients, this summing potential will be very low. If it exceeds half of the action potential, that's when it's abnormal and it's an indicator of Meniere's disease. That's why the doctor ordered the test to begin with. So here we're just looking, a, a lot of times when you look in the literature, you see it upside down. You go, boy, that's upside down. Uh, well, that's the way it was done originally. We just decided that we like all the waves going up, so we've reversed the electrodes. But it's the same thing as summing potential and an action potential, and a summing potential amplitude being less than half of the action potential amplitude, which it is in these two cases. 
Here's others with the waves going up that we're more used to. No doubt that this is a repeatable summing potential and action potential there. It's repeated down here. Same thing here. I wouldn't have to even do any calculation on this, and the machine will do it automatically. The software will do it. But I wouldn't even have to calculate the ratio just by looking at it. That's a very small fraction of the action potential amplitude. But you've got to watch the hearing loss. Here's the big problem. Doctors are trying to order this test, and you know you're never going to get it when you have a significant high-frequency loss like this. I didn't have a significant loss. That's why I still got it on mine. Uh, but on this patient, what do you expect to get? I'll show you what we got. Got this. I, his left ear was normal, of course, and we've got a perfect ECOG, but we couldn't get it at all on, on his right ear. And, and we should have known that when we looked at the, at the audiogram. So a lot of clinics, when they're talking to their doctors, they come up with a, a rule. Like what's very common is, a, is a, a 2K20 or 2K25 rule. In other words, you look at the threshold at 2K, and if it exceeds 25 dB, then we're not going to do an ECOG with tiptrodes because we know we won't get a good result. But a lot of times, well, you try it anyway, even though... 50 dB threshold at 2,000, um, you, just, you just never get it. So as a clinic, if you could just have a rule of what patients are, are candidates for uh, ECOGs with tiptrodes and which are not, that would be helpful. Here's an abnormal case. Notice in the left ear, there's a clear summing potential here, and this summing potential is uh, clearly less than half of the amplitude of the action potential. But look at this on the affected side of Meniere's. Uh, baseline to summing potential way up here, uh, and baseline to action potential. And you end up with an SPAP ratio of greater than 0.5. That's what makes it abnormal. So here's, here's the rules of thumb. This, this is good to know if you're doing ECOGs for the first time. The first thing to look for is where's the action potential, and you should find it quickly and easily at about 1.5 milliseconds at 95 dB on a normal adult. Uh, and so that's the first thing. If you don't have that, forget it. You've got too much hearing loss. And where's the summing potential going to be? Find this first and mark it, and then move your cursor back about 0.6 milliseconds, and the summing potential is going to be there. Find the action potential first, move the cursor back about 0.6, maybe 0.7 milliseconds at the most, and you'll find the summing potential. Uh, how to find the baseline? Well, you found the summing potential, move it back about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 milliseconds to the left of that, and there's the baseline. Right? A lot of times I say this, um, if I'm trying to mark this, here's the base, this is a mountain, and so the action potential is a mountain peak. And if I fell off this mountain and I got down here, I see there's a little foothill. Well, the top of the foothill is the summing potential, and then the, the bottom of that foothill, that valley, that's the baseline. So a lot of times we use that, but it's good to know how many milliseconds separates them, right? An SPAP ratio of uh, anything greater than 0.5 is abnormal. And unfortunately, the predictive positive value is just 63%. In other words, in 63% of patients with Meniere's disease, you'll actually get an abnormal uh, ECOG on. So it's, it's, it's not as sensitive as we'd like it to be. Uh, a couple of other things to know is uh, you got to use prep in the ear canal. Now, you're not just doing skin prep, you're actually doing ear canal prep. And we just use a, uh, a Q-tip, but we put a little bit, a little dab of new prep on the Q-tip, so we're degreasing and abrading the ear canal, and we're doing it very deep, very deep canal placement. That's necessary. Make sure you insist on at least a 2K25 rule. Now, no threshold at 2K worse than 25. Uh, if I'm expect to be able to do this test. And of course, like everything, you remember, if it doesn't replicate, you must investigate. I see people that don't have replicable ECOG responses, and they just keep on doing one after another and another and another until they got a bump that comes up around 
uh, 1.5 milliseconds, and they call that the action potential, and, and they, mark, they mark it down at the bottom somewhere as a summing potential, and it's nothing because it doesn't repeat. It just happens to be a random EEG that, that showed up like that. Um, if you do it enough, you'll find one, even when it's not there. Um, there is a new test, and uh, some of the manufacturers like Interacoustics and Biologic already have it on their equipment, and the other manufacturers are actually putting it on their equipment, even as we speak, and that's a measurement of the area. It's the ECOG, not, not only the SPAP ratio, but the area ratio. That's the area under the curve, right? Uh, and why would we want to do this? Well, the sensitivity is higher. The sensitivity isn't 63%, now it's 83%, and it's very, very easy to do. When it's on your equipment, you definitely want to do it because it's a, it makes this test way more sensitive. And all you got to do is, uh, this is, uh, with the summing potential, you want to mark the baseline and the summing potential, the action potential, and then not just the leading trough, but the, the, uh, uh, the end of it too. So you really have to do four marks like this. I know it's upside down, but just four marks like this. And then it's able to give you the area, and it just makes it more sensitive when you're able to measure the area um, rather than just the APSP ratio. Right. And so w I put this slide up here. The ROI is return on investment. Right. Uh, interacoustics and their interacoustics eclipse eclipses their model num their model of their auditory evoked potential system, but they have a model that you could buy. Uh, this particular version of this equipment would be if you were testing really all adults and you're doing adult ABRs, ECOGs and VEMPs, CVEMPs and OVEMPs, and you just wanted it configured like that, all right? Well, they'll sell that for 14000 and you've got to buy a notebook computer. I put it at 2500 because you'd never spend more than 2500 on a notebook computer. So it totally would cost you sixteen five. It'd probably be pretty close at a fifteen five. Um, but anyway... So what do you get for doing an ABR, an adult diagnostic ABR, about 137, uh, ECOG about 75. So if you were doing those two tests, and yeah, you did VEMPs, you did VEMPs too, um, but this is what your reimbursement's going to be, uh, something around uh, 212. Well, if you paid that much for the laptop computer, it would take you 78 patients for this thing to pay for itself. Well, if you work that out, if you did three patients a day, it would be five weeks. If you did one patient a day, it would be 15 weeks. So in a lot of clinics, um, this could pay for itself, and you would end up doing ECOGs, CVEMPs, and OVEMPs with it, and you'd add a lot to your uh, sensitivity of your uh, balance clinic. Uh, well, an, uh, an ECOG doesn't really have to take that long. Uh, I told you that a, a CVAMP doesn't take long, or an OVAMP, because you're only doing, uh, you're only doing this for about 10, 10 15 seconds per, per run, and you do four runs, two on each side. So that's a very, very quick test. Uh, and these two, I never do over 1,000 stimuli at about 10 per second, so there's no reason why you couldn't do both ears in, in 20 minutes on this if you're getting a response. Now, if you can't get a response, well, that's because you had too much hearing loss and, and you, know, you just wouldn't waste time on it. Uh, all right, well, so it's, it's just saying that this equipment can pay for itself if it's used enough. Uh, and, uh, and in a lot of clinics, it is. Thanks, guys.